All right, man, peace. So, brothers, LeBron James was fortunate enough to live off of the fat of the land of the Eastern Conference for almost 10 seasons, all the way from 2010 to 2018. Not only was LeBron James on pretty much the best team in the Eastern Conference, he also was able to hit his proverbial stride as a player at the same time when many other teams were either in a state of transition or they were trying to develop young players. There's a reason why that when we think of the Miami Heat and their great quote-unquote rivals during that time period, we either think of an aging Boston Celtics team with a Kevin Garnett, a Ray Allen, and a Paul Pierce at the very end of their primes, or we think of the Chicago Bulls with only one star player in a Derrick Rose, or an Indiana Pacers team that had no stars at all other than a neophyte Paul George. But just to get back to the point, LeBron had laid waste to the Eastern Conference for so long that even in the aftermath of his departure, there are still newly great players left in the Eastern Conference who started to develop their game overall in the last couple of seasons who still think of LeBron James with a sense of awe, one of them being Giannis Antetokounmpo. And let me say this, mental intimidation is as important a factor in winning as a disparity in skill set, roster, coaching differential, things of that nature. Mental intimidation is extremely essential, extremely important when it comes to why certain teams are champions and why other teams are just contenders. So the fact that Giannis would admit this, I think, might be a little chink in his armor. You never, ever admit that you're happy that another player left your conference. But anyway, they're going to talk about it. I'm going to chime in. Tonight, Giannis and the Bucks look to go up 2-0 on the Raptors. Yesterday, the Greek freak was asked whether LeBron vacating the East opened a door for Milwaukee. Giannis said, didn't, but it also kind of did. Well, LeBron is you know, a great player, but, um, but when he left uh, the East, you know, he's, a, he's a great player going to the West. I'm not going to lie to you. When the season started, I didn't know we were going to be the East Coast Finals. I'm not going to lie to you. I just know that he's a tough player that we always have problems against him, uh, against the Cavs, and uh, now he's not playing for the Cavs, so it's going to be a little bit easier. Right, but you know what, bro? Last season, you were a somewhere in the area of a 45-win team. Now you're a 60-win team. So there was huge growth in the level of ability that your team showed, especially due to the, to the coaching acquisition of Budenholzer. And let me say this. This is why I state that LeBron James was in the Eastern Conference at the perfect time. Because not only did he happen to be the best player in the NBA for the 2000s, but also the Eastern Conference was in a state of flux. When we think of the best players in the entire NBA, let's say, for example, the top 10 players in the entire NBA, a relatively decent amount of them, you can argue, are in the Eastern Conference right now. You probably would not have been able to make that argument just last season. Now with a Kawhi Leonard, who's arguably the best player in the NBA, certainly top three. Well, you know what? I'll say certainly top four because he's no lower than four. On my list, I would say he's somewhere in that three to four-ish range, depending on where you want to place LeBron James at this point in his career. With a Giannis Antetokounmpo making the quantum leap from last season, as well as a Joel Embiid, a Ben Simmons, you can make a case that the Eastern Conference has four of the top 15 to 20 players in the NBA. I don't think that you can make that case even last season. So LeBron pretty much got out at the perfect time. It's very rare in the history of the NBA where the top two or even top three players in the league are all in the same conference. So once again, LeBron was very fortunate. Just thinking back, I would say maybe the last time that that was the case may have been, I want to say maybe the early 80s with Larry Bird and Dr. J or Larry Bird and Moses Malone, where you had two of the top three players in the entire NBA in, in the Eastern Conference. Um, that certainly was not the case in the Jordan era. Jordan was the number one player in the NBA. But then after that, you can make the case that the next seven or eight best players, well, you know, I'm not going to go that far because Patrick Ewing was definitely a top 10 player in the early 90s. But after that, you have Charles Barkley, you have Hakeem Olajuwon, David Robinson, Karl Malone. They were all in the West. Now, by the mid-90s, you did have Shaquille O'Neal and Penny Hardaway. They were certainly two of the top six or seven players, maybe even two of the top five players in the NBA when the Bulls faced off against them in 95 and 96. Let's say by 1998, the last year of the Chicago Bulls run, the Indiana Pacers did not have one of the top 10 players in the NBA, I don't think, but they were certainly either the second or third best team in the entire NBA. So it is what it is. I ain't see that as open, but now that I look back, it, 
looking at so how everything went, it's definitely an opening, you know, not having LeBron in the East and not trying to go through him. Maybe he was just trying to compliment LeBron James, but he, he probably should have left it more along the lines of how much growth his own team has experienced over the last year rather than how fortunate he thinks they are to not have to face LeBron in the Eastern Conference. Milwaukee is seizing that opportunity so far. They're 9-1 and one this postseason, and a win tonight would match the best 11-game playoff start ever for an Eastern Conference team. That's it for your Sports Center right now. Let's send you back to first take. No question, Phil. Happy Friday to you. Fear the King party people. Jan is talking about LeBron's impact when he played in the East. Stephen A., you're up first. Talk to me about those comments. LeBron James was pretty much a man amongst boys for a seven or eight year period in the Eastern Conference. Once again, Paul George was in a neophyte stage. I'll say by the mid 2010s, you had Giannis coming up, you had Joel B coming up. So LeBron was fortunate. I mean, he was not even he was not even facing other great players who you could call his peer. At least Michael Jordan in the late 80s, early 90s, when he was going up against the bad boy Pistons with Isaiah Thomas, going up against the Knicks with Patrick Ewing, going against Cleveland who had Brad Darty, Mark Price. Those are players who were a level or two beneath him, but at least age-wise, they were his peers. So there was no mental intimidation there. They, they just were not good enough to get the job done. About what? which comments? Which comments about, uh, about the Greek freak and LeBron? Yes, yes, yes. Talking about LeBron. Well, listen, uh, listen. The, the bottom line is he's acknowledging what everybody knows, that the East, there's a path, there's a le uh, lesser path of, path of resistance uh, to, to championship contention or to the Eastern Conference crown without LeBron James in the Eastern Conference. I would have loved to have seen the Cleveland Cavaliers team, even with Kyrie Irving, go up against these Milwaukee Bucks. Even with the Bucks being down three games to two against the Toronto Raptors, I would have loved to have seen that series because I think that the length and the defense of the Milwaukee Bucks, as well as the great shooting, would have given the Cavaliers all they could have handled. Whether you're talking about the 2016 Cleveland Cavaliers or 2017 Cleveland Cavaliers, this Milwaukee Bucks team would have given them hell because LeBron's teams normally do not do well against basketball teams that have a high IQ overall as a team from top to bottom. Uh, we all know that a whole bunch of folks look like a bunch of petrified puppies. Or well, let me take that back. It was really the Toronto Raptors that looked like a bunch of petrified puppies. Whatever. Yeah, with DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry. Of course they're going to look petrified. Their two leaders have mental issues. Whenever they went up against LeBron James, uh, when you look at the Boston Celtics, they fought valiantly. When you look at the, at the Indiana Pacers, uh, they tried to fight them. Uh, when Lance Stevenson, and this is even after Lance Stevenson was blowing in his ears, the Pacers just did not have enough firepower. The Celtics were at the very end of their prime physically by the time LeBron James went to Miami. So that was going to be a very difficult matchup for them. There's plenty of people throughout the years that have fought. The Toronto Raptors looked absolutely positively petrified, but that was pre-Kawhi Leonard era. Uh, but if you're the Greek freak, if you're Giannis, you look at the dominance of a LeBron James, you see what he's done to the Eastern Conference. He went to eight straight NBA Finals, for crying out loud, completely owned the Eastern Conference. And in a couple of cases, people were absolutely positively petrified. That wasn't going to be the case with Giannis, but what you heard from him was just a realization that if LeBron James was in this conference, uh, it wouldn't be that we wouldn't be sitting here as comfortably as we're sitting here right now. Well, LeBron would certainly have been a specter hovering over the rest of the conference, but it would have been more from a big brother, little brother perspective than from a I have a better team than yours perspective. I certainly think that this year's Milwaukee Bucks would have beaten last season's Cleveland Cavaliers. No doubt about that. Believing or sniffing in an NBA Finals berth we would be a hell, a hell of a lot more worried about getting past him. It was very obvious. Giannis, it's not that he's not telling the truth. He's just a humble dude. It's one of the reasons he's replaced Westbrook, Stephen A. As my well, he's a realist. And that's why I state that Giannis, despite his limitations offensively, is going to be the person who's going to lead the NBA for the next 10 years because he's a great leader. He has leadership qualities through the roof. He takes accountability for himself, not just for his team. You know, you have certain people like Kyrie Irving who want to blame everybody else but himself. Giannis starts with himself, and he's a realist. He appraises things realistically. Sometimes he's a bit too transparent, like in this situation. But once again, that is why he's going to be the person who eventually is going to be sitting on the throne when we try to ascertain who's going to be the best player in the league for the next 10 years or who's going to be the, the NBA ambassador for the next 10 years. I believe that it's going to be Giannis Antetokounmpo. Not because he's the most talented or has the greatest skill set, no. 
That's Kawhi Leonard. That's Kevin Durant. That's Steph Curry. All those players have a far greater diversity of skills than Giannis. But Giannis has a lot of idiosyncratic characteristics. He has a lot of intangibles that you just can't, you know, you just can't find everywhere. He's my favorite player in the NBA. You know, we all know the story. We've told it on the show many times of Molly. He lives in a two-bedroom apartment yeah. with his family. I told you the story about how he sent the, his first game check back home. So didn't have any money even to get to the arena. Had to start jogging to the arena when a fan spotted him, drove him there. How he doesn't want to play outside of Milwaukee. Is not looking to, like, leave somewhere. Wants to get guys there. Believes in his crew. How his teammates love him, right? Won't work out with the opposition in the offseason. That's the enemy. I'm not buddy-buddy with these dudes. I'm already on record as stating all that's cool if you want to appease a lot of the quote-unquote hardcore basketball fans who want to believe that players back in the 80s never worked out together. As I've already stated, Magic Johnson, Mark Aguirre, Dominique Wilkins, Isaiah Thomas all used to work out together in the offseason. Herb Williams with them as well. There's no problem with that because that's how you get better. You have to be around the best of the best if you're in that ilk in order to get better. And that's one of the main reasons why Giannis' offensive game is so limited. I call him the modern day Shaq because that's what he is. He has a Shaquille O'Neal approach to offense. And in order for him to get to the next level, he is going to have to diversify his offensive skill set. Even Kawhi Leonard engages in, in basketball runs in the offseason with LeBron James and a lot of these guys out there in L.A. So, I mean, <laughs> if Kawhi does it and he does not talk to anybody, I think that Giannis, I think that he might want to open up his understanding as to what he can learn from many of the other great players in the league. At the very least, just observing them and watching their offensive moves, what they like to do and how he might nullify it in a real game situation. There's nothing wrong with that. This notion that, oh, well, you know what, they're over there, I'm over here, that's just not wise. If you have the opportunity to execute a reconnaissance mission and, and attain some level of intel on your opponent, why would you not do that? That's why they're all doing it. That's why they all get together and have these runs. They want to learn as much about the, the other great players in the league, their peers, what they like to do, what they don't like to do. And there's just a serious gap in Giannis's understanding of offensive basketball from the other great players. But because of his drive, his name has to be mentioned amongst those other guys. But when you compare Giannis's offensive repertoire to an Anthony Davis or Joel Embiid or, I mean, not even talking about a Steph Curry, a Kawhi Leonard, a, a Kevin Durant, those guys are the creme de la creme when it comes to their understanding of offensive basketball. But my point is, we mentioned Giannis with those other players, even though the disparity between himself and all those other guys is, is very vast. I mean, it's prominent. The difference between Giannis's offensive skill set and those other players. And I think that he can learn a lot by working out with them. Love me some Giannis, and in addition to all that, he's just a humble, thoughtful, honest guy. However, if what you take from that is that Giannis is saying, ooh, thank God LeBron's not in the East because then we wouldn't be sitting here so comfortably. I'm going to tell you then Giannis is wrong. They'd, I agree with you. They'd be playing the exact same team they would have been playing. Because LeBron and the Cavs, meaning him, even if Kyrie was still there with Kevin Love, would have been beaten by this Raptors team. I agree with that. Which is deeper and right now in Kawhi has a better two-way player. And let me say this. The Toronto Raptors... Their ability to defend is unbelievable. People have to understand this. They have two former Defensive Player of the Year winners in their starting lineup, and Mark Gasol and Kawhi Leonard. They have another player in Pascal Siakam, who I'm not quite sure where he finished when it comes to the all-defense team. But he has the potential to be a Scottie Pippen-esque defender. Just from what I view and what I see when I see in many of these games, especially as a help defender, he is excellent. So I think just defensively, they would have given those Cleveland Cavalier teams hell. And they would have been beaten by the Bucks team, I think, handily. I agree. Because it's not clear that LeBron James is better than Kawhi Leonard or Giannis Antetokounmpo anymore. And these... Strange for you to say that, especially since you were the person who claimed that LeBron James was light years ahead of everyone else in the NBA. It's amazing how quickly these other players can traverse those light years to catch up to your boy. These teams play together cohesively as a unit. They defend. They shoot the lights out. The Bucks do from three. I'm telling you right now, if Giannis believes he would be in any different position than he is right now, if LeBron is in the East, I believe he is mistaken. This was going to be the Eastern Conference Finals. 
the team, my preseason pick, the Raptors, and then my in-season pick, the Bucks are playing for the Eastern Conference Finals right now, and it wouldn't matter if LeBron's in the East. Well, By the way, I know it's not fair, Stephen A., because the Lakers didn't really have anyone, and he got hurt, who'd say he wouldn't be hurt had he stayed with the Cavs. Yeah. But he didn't even make the playoffs in the West. Didn't even make the playoffs. That's what happens when you go from the JV to the varsity. Well, first of all, LeBron James averaged 27 like he always does, number one. All that means is that 27 points is not the same, <laughs> Stephen A. You can go from one conference to another conference, and that 27 points means something completely different. That's all that means. Beyond that, LeBron James is someone who knows how to get his stats. LeBron knows. All he has to do is go to the hole seven, eight times in the game. Either he's going to score a bucket or he's going to get a foul call. If he can make four or five jump shots over the course of the game, he's going to look at the stat sheet. He's going to have 25 points, 25 to 28 points. So it's not that difficult for someone of, of his abilities. Number two, I think you're forgetting something that's very, very important. So I'm going to bring it up to you right now. You can't say for once so definitively at all. I mean, all of it is hypothetical because obviously he's no longer in the Eastern Conference. But there's no evidence that we've seen from the Milwaukee Bucks that says they would have beaten the Cleveland Cavaliers for this reason, Max. Stephen A. Smith, I have to stop you there. Milwaukee finished the season ranked, I believe, number one overall defensively and top three offensively. Were there any other teams that the Cavaliers faced during the LeBron James tenure who were that high in both offensive and defensive metrics? I don't think that 60-win Hawks team that the Cleveland Cavaliers swept, I think maybe in 2016, I don't think that they were anywhere near that high in both offensive and defensive metrics. If I'm wrong about that, one of you brothers, please correct me. But this is a whole different team. This Milwaukee Bucks team is a very high caliber team. They just happen to be facing another team that's equally as high caliber with a better player. Once again, as I've always stated, the top four players in the NBA, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, Kawhi Leonard, and that, and that has been bearing fruit for this entire postseason. Now, LeBron James has to take a few steps back, especially since he did not make the playoffs this year. So as of right now, I might have him number four behind Steph Curry and Kevin Durant and, and Kawhi Leonard in no particular order. I might have to have LeBron at either number three or four. But that top four stays the same. There are only four superstars in the NBA. I'm going to say it again. There are only four superstars in the NBA. A superstar has to be a player who has won at least a regular season MVP and a finals. You have to have done both. Regular season MVP and or finals MVP and won a finals. If you have not done that, you're not a superstar. All you are is a player on the come up. More than anything, we worried about Cleveland offensively after Kyrie left and LeBron James carried them to the NBA Finals. We forget how stellar they were defensively. The one thing that J.R. Smith... Did this Negro just state that the Cleveland Cavaliers were a stellar defensive team? George Hill, Tristan Thompson, Kevin Love, and all of those guys did. George Hill was on last year's Cleveland Cavaliers team. Was last year's Cleveland Cavaliers team a good defensive team? Somebody please help me with that. Collectively, was played defense come playoff time. Offensively, they leaned heavily on LeBron James, who utilized his basketball brilliance to create mismatches for himself and everybody around. Stephen A. Smith. The Cleveland Cavaliers in last year's playoffs, in last year's playoffs, I believe in the three rounds that they won, they played the Indiana Pacers, a series that they should have lost. That series went seven games, and the Pacers blew at least two of those games. They should have lost that series, but they won. I give them credit. Against a neophyte Pacers team that had no idea what they were doing. In the second round, they, they squared off against the Toronto Raptors, a team who they own mentally, a team that was led by two mentally fractured borderline bubble star players not even uh, bubble superstar players bubble star players in DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry so they were easy pickings in the third round they squared off against a Boston Celtics team that were led by a bevy of players 23 years old and younger who never had any major playoff experience and who were undermanned and that series won seven games so before we talk about the Cleveland Cavaliers and how great their defense was I mean let's pump the brakes for a minute there's been, once again, there's been a quantum leap in the Eastern Conference from last year to this year. As a matter of fact, in my view, I think that after the Golden State Warriors, 
the next four best teams, you can make the case that the next four best teams were all in the East. I think that the Toronto Raptors, the Milwaukee Bucks, the Philadelphia 76ers, and even the Boston Celtics, depending on how together they're willing to play, could be considered the, the next four best teams. And even if you don't want to include the Boston Celtics, certainly those three other teams, we would have to say, should, should be considered in that group. Round him, but defensively, they were locked in. Bullshit. And when you look at how Milwaukee has struggled from time to time throughout these playoffs in terms of putting points on the board. Yes, they play elite defense too. So it comes down to what would you have been able to do with LeBron? That's a question, and we can debate that. But let's not assume that, excuse me, they would have taken Cleveland out because Cleveland's defense was no joke. Well, listen, no you, joke. Okay, but Milwaukee's defense... Brogdon's a willing defender, if not a good one. Middleton's a good defender. Miritich is underrated. He's athletic. He's just not very strong, but quick feet. Toronto knows what he's was doing. considered to have a good defense last the, year. The freak is excellent defensively. Clean. Lopez is not a great defender, but he's an excellent rim defender. Bledsoe's an excellent defender off the bench. Hill off the bench. They got guys Question. who can defend on this team. But real quick, Question. Stephen A, I'm you, oh, real quick before we get to Milwaukee, you talked about how now they got Kawhi. It's not going to be the scared puppy team, right? My point is, I don't think Milwaukee would have had to play Cleveland. Toronto could have played traffic cop for Milwaukee anyway. I still think this is the Eastern Conference Finals. I agree. I definitely agree. Well, it's, it's, it's entirely possible, Max, that Milwaukee could have ended up beating Cleveland before Toronto did. So we don't know that. You know, it's all about scenics. But what I'm saying to you is this. When you picked Toronto to beat Cleveland last year, why did you pick Toronto? It wasn't because of their offense. You were raving about their defense, too, and how they had a collection of bodies that could really cause problems for Cleveland. All season last season, I stated that until I see someone beat the Cleveland Cavaliers, I'm going to pick them because I had no confidence in any of the other teams in the Eastern Conference to be able to beat a team in Cleveland who clearly was hobbled. And, you know, they, they were like an old antelope on the Serengeti. Yes, we know that if that antelope was unfortunate enough to run into a pride of lions or a leopard that was waiting for it up in a tree, that it was dead meat. But if it happened to be walking on a Serengeti plane where there were no predators, it was going to make it. And then LeBron just took over and snatched well, their heart right out of their chest. No doubt. No doubt. My whole question last year is could DeRozan be the best player on a, at least the conference finals team? The answer was no. But I Hell no. DeRozan can barely be the best player on a team that gets out of the first round. But I know Kawhi could. So if you if you take DeRozan off of last year's team and drop Kawhi, a healthy Kawhi on it, I'd have taken to I'd take Toronto all over again, and I believe they would win. We see the difference between a real MVP caliber player who could lead a team to a championship and just an All Star caliber player. They got that dude now in Toronto. A bubble All Star caliber player. I saw DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry. They even cost their team in the All-Star game. They, they're just terrible, those two guys. Toronto, and you and, they and, have you, and, I, and, and you and I feel something. different because I believe Cleveland would have still beaten them, except the only difference is they would not have swept with Kawhi. Yeah. Right, like remember, they swept no Kyrie, Rosen and Lowry. No Kyrie on that Cleveland team. I'm, listen, I, know, Cleveland, I, I remember. Cleveland still would have been stuff. better than both. Wow. So, Stephen A. Smith, you have the 2018 Cavaliers beating these Toronto Raptors. Wow. I got you. Than Boston and Philadelphia, but Toronto and Milwaukee ain't mm -hmm. Boston and Philadelphia. Let me get in here, guys. All right. Obviously, when LeBron was in the East, he dominated, right? No one could get past him. Do you feel like Giannis is going to rule the East in the same way now? It depends on how willing he is to grow his game and how willing he is to utilize every avenue available to him to expand his offensive repertoire. But as of right now, he has all the intangibles. Great leader. Phenomenal leader. I, I would say yes, and I believe it starts this year. Uh -huh. But I got to see him get by Kawhi. Kawhi at least temporarily is in the East. He probably won't be in the East next year is my best guess. It'll be with the Clippers. But, but right now he's got to get by Kawhi. I know they're up in the series. That is no easy task. After this year, and I, I even believe now starting I got to see, the answer is yes. I believe the Greek freak will run the East. And by the way, if he was crewed up in the West, I think he'd run the West too. My suspicion is he's the best player in the NBA. I think that he has the potential to be the, the next ambassador in the NBA. I agree with the assessment that he's the modern-day Shaq. 
but he also needs to expand on his repertoire. Because even if Shaq played today, he could not play just how he played back in the 90s and throughout the early to mid 2000s. He would have had to have had a bit more. The Greek freak is going to have to, he's going to have to grow himself over these next few years, and I think that he can. But is he, is he the best player in the league right now? No. Is he the, MV, is he the MVP for this season? Yes. I'm not ruling out. I'm not going to say that and because I'm not ruling out uh, the resurrection of the Philadelphia 76ers or the ascension of the Philadelphia 76ers. After suffering the devastating loss in Game 7 that they did to Toronto, I want to see if there could ever be a healthy Joel Embiid. And I want to see if somebody is going to get all up in Ben Simmons' face and get him to attempt some perimeter shots. Those are two tall tasks. I do understand that. But if those two things were to happen in an elevated or improved fashion, I believe Philadelphia could take Milwaukee. All right. I partially agree with that, as I've already stated. I think that all three of those teams are in that same realm. They're on the same level. Uh, game two today at 8.30, guys. We will leave it. But anyway, that's basically it on that. Giannis Antetokounmpo, do not make a habit of giving your rivals too much credit. That gives them a mental advantage. So peace.